The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to today's Wednesday webinar. Today we're going to be talking about for, more Form space fun. Um, this is sort of a follow up to a webinar that we did a couple of weeks ago. And so we're going to take it from there and, and add some new features, hopefully, give you some things that you may not be familiar with or some new information to add to your repertoire. Um, I want to start by talking about if it will let me advance. And it's, there we go, oops, I went too fast. I want to talk about who we are and what we're doing today. So I'm Paige Parker, I'm one of the training and implementation specialists. And also on the line today is Joel Adkins. He is muted right now, unless he wants to bust in and say hi. Hi everyone. <laughs> There's Joel, and he's gonna be answering, our, answering questions as we go through the webinar and maybe piping in and sharing some information too as we go along. So that's who your team is today. Before we get started, I want to remind everybody where you can find resources in our system. You can always go to edgeforia.zendesk.com and find the online resources for every one of our applications. But you can also find it from the main screen, there's a help button, and from the, each of the applications, there's a help button. So wherever you are in our product, you can click on help and get to that screen as well. And we do have a section for form space and we've got some articles out there and I'll be showing a couple things from there later on. But just so that you can relax and know that there's resources ready, I wanted to point that out up front. Um, as we go through the session today, I'm going to ask that if you have questions in your control panel for the webinar, there is a section for questions, not the chat section, but the question section. If you'll click on that and type your questions in, that's where Joel's going to be answering and, and we may do some questions um, out loud if we have a, a lot that are asking the same thing. So if you'll put your questions there, that will help us out. Before we jump in, I want to get a little bit of information from you guys. So I'm going to start with a poll and just ask you two quick questions. Here's question number one. I want to know how many of you attended the Form Space webinar that we had on March 21st. And that's one that Joel presented. And I'm trying to get just an idea of how many people are here who were also there. And it looks like we're at about, we're getting close to 100%. No, we're at 70%. I was trying to do math and that's never a good idea. I'll give it a couple more seconds for everybody to finish up with their votes because the numbers are starting to slow down just a little bit. All right, we haven't changed in a bit, so I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. Last chance, three, two, one. All right, so I can show you the results. We have about 33% of you, about a third of you did attend the, the previous webinar. Some of you didn't know about it, so I'm glad you found out about this one. And then some of you registered but couldn't attend, and that happens a lot. It's, it's still a good idea to register because you can always watch the recordings, and we do email those recordings to you when it's, uh, when it's all said and done. I have one more quick question just to find out a little bit about the group. Select one of the following to rate your skills, please, in form space. Are you a newbie? Have you had your toes in the water a little bit? Have you done lots of basic forms? Or can you do pretty much anything in form space? Okay, so we're spread out a little bit. Voting has, or answering has slowed down. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. All right, and I'll share the results of that one as well. We have 23 who rate themselves as newbies. 
we have 46 who have had their toes in the water so you've done some things with form space but need to learn more we have some worker bees in the group um, lots of experience with the basics hopefully we're going to show you some things today that maybe aren't quite as basic and that'll be a learning experience for you too and we've got eight percent who are rocking it and I need to look and find out who those people are so that y'all can be offering the next webinar that we have on form space so that's great we have a good mixed group today so let's go ahead and get started here is the agenda for what we're going to be talking about today we're I'm going to talk just for a second about Google Forms versus Formspace. I am not anti-Google Form. I, I, I think that's a fabulous tool. But to me, the pro, the biggest pro of Formspace is that it's easy for you to set up workflows so that you can route forms to multiple places within your district using groups that you already have set up in the management piece. And you can keep track of where all of those forms are and know um, easily who you know whose desk is it stuck on that was always my problem with paper forms that it went into somebody's inbox and I had no idea what step in the process was the holdup but with form space and workflows you can do that and I think that's a huge advantage for school districts um, we're going to talk about types of forms and types of audiences for the forms that you have just briefly we're going to do Question types, it's going to be a review for some of you, but those of you who are newbies um, and, and maybe even some who've done basics, there may be some question types that you're not familiar with. We're going to talk about workflows and how you can use them to your advantage. We're going to talk about the community, elections, and then some tips and tricks. So hopefully some things that will make your work in form space a little bit easier. To begin, let's talk about types of forms, types of audiences. What kind of document should you create? Do I want a form or do I want a survey? Because form space can do both. But you need to know, you know, what are you trying to accomplish? What do I want to get out of it? Both forms and surveys do data collection. So you're going to get information in whether you choose a form or a survey. Both forms and surveys can export that data. Forms can do a few things that surveys can't with with both of them, I can get an Excel spreadsheet of my data. But with a form, I can also get a PDF version or I can get I can do a mail merge into a, a, a document of my choice. With a survey, I can't do mail merges and I don't get my PDFs, but I can get a summary or I can get that Excel spreadsheet. So those top two are very similar in terms of getting the data out. And then I can once it's in Excel, I can do whatever I want with it. Here's where they differ a little bit. If it's a form, the user goes and finds that form. So your end user is going to go to form space and they are going to click on submit a new form, which is down here in the lower left hand corner. And they're going to find that form in whatever categories you have set up for them. In my demo site, I only have one category, but you could have a folder here that said HR, a folder here that said technology, you could organize your forms to make it easier for your users to find them, but they're going to go, they're going to log in and go find the form. With a survey, the user is sent the survey. So you're going to send an email at, with a link to the survey, or you're going to put that link on your website so that only the recipients, only the people that I give access to that URL will be able to complete the survey they can't go find it on their own so I can't have people that I don't want I can limit my participants if I do it through a survey um, the biggest difference I think is that the workflow process is only available in forms so in a form I can have workflows with multiple steps they can be approval steps notification steps I can have multiple workflows for one form. It can go to multiple people. So I have a way to route it through whatever process I'm using in my district. With a survey, there is no workflow. The recipient gets the survey. They answer the questions. That data goes in, the end. So there's no process to a survey. And then the final difference is there are fewer question types for a survey than there are for a form. And part of that has to do with the processes that are involved in, in building a form. So sometimes if I want to do a quick survey, I want to just have a couple of questions, get the information in, and that's it. 
a survey might be what I need and I can just email my whole faculty and give them the link, they take the survey, we're done. Other times if there's a process involved, I want it to go through approvals, I need to do a form. So after we decide what kind of document we want, then we need to decide who our audience is. You can create district forms and district surveys, and those can be completed by anyone in your district that has an Eduforia or School Objects account. So that can be anybody. It can be limited to a particular school or a particular department through the workflow if it's a form, but it can potentially be for anybody in your district. A school form, they still have to have a School Objects or Eduforia account, but it's limited only to users at that school and that limit comes from their profile. So if my profile says I'm at Aqua Elementary, then I will only see school forms from Aqua Elementary. The web forms can be, or can be done by anyone. It can be community members, parents, anyone in the world, if you set it up as a web form or a web survey. So you have different audiences to consider when you're building your forms or your surveys in addition to the different document types. Any questions so far, Joel? Not a single one. Uh, I think you're doing such a great job. <laughs> well, I figured this part wouldn't be so much on the questions, but I wanted to check before I move on. So we're going to jump into some of the advanced functions. And um, first off, I want to talk about workflows. So I'm going to go into form space and I'm going to go to manage because I'm on the creation side of a form, setting the form up and setting up the workflows. I'm going to go into my district forms and you'll notice I have some default folders over here. I have a place for district forms and district surveys. That's the, the same audience, two different kinds of documents. I have school forms, school surveys, same audience, two different kinds, web forms and web surveys. So those audiences and document types, we have a place for them here in, in the default list under manage. If I go into district forms, then I will see my categories. So I had a category for general forms that showed up on that main screen, but I told you that I could add in other categories. So I could have one that I call technology and I could add it in and I could have one that was for HR forms and I could change the icon if I wanted to for my HR forms and make it be a check mark. So I can add in whatever categories I want to and then when I look in district forms now I have three different sections and if I went in as an, a user and I'll, oh, I'm, I want to go into my forms. If I went in as an end user and I'm looking for a form that I need to create or fill out, now I have those three different categories. So you could tell them, go to Edgeforia and look in the technology folder and complete this form. And that's how they would, that's how they would navigate to it. So you can create as many categories as you want to. Once I click on that district form, I can add categories in. If I wanted to add categories to my district surveys, Oh, I don't have categories for surveys, just for forms. Sorry, if I wanted to go in and add categories to my school forms, um, I can do that as well. So I've got categories. Now I wanna go in and look at a form that's already there. So for this one, I'm gonna use a form I've already created. Um, we're not gonna start at the beginning of form creation, but we're gonna take one and look at how it's set up. So this is a, a request for using IMAT money, to purchase something, just some basic questions about what, you know, what all this resource requires. But I have a process for this. So I'm going to go to the workflow tab and you'll notice I have two different workflows set up here for this one document. What that means is if this document comes in from one of my secondary schools, it's going to go through one process. But if the form comes in from a, an elementary school, they have a different process. Maybe, you know, secondary schools might have instructional coaches or department heads that are part of the workflow process and elementaries don't have those positions. So the process is different at the different kinds of schools. Rather than having an elementary form and a secondary form, which you can do, 
I want to put them in a single form with two different workflows because I want all the data in the same place. Just because their process is different doesn't mean I should have to do more work to get the data together. So this way I have one form, it goes to everybody in the district, but what happens after they submit it is different depending on where they are. So I'm going to go first to my secondary schools and double click on that workflow. The workflow has two tabs. It always opens to the general tab and the general tab is where you can name the workflow. There's, it always says default workflow unless you change the name and I like to change them just because it helps me to know which one is which. And then on most, on the default, all schools will be selected. But if in this case, I'm limiting it just to the secondary schools, I can say limit to the following and I check off just my secondary schools. So these are the only campuses, these four, that are going to use this particular process. Once I have seen that all of my schools are right, this, this secondary process applies to these schools, then I'm going to go to the workflow tab and see what happens. So what happens at the secondary schools is that they all go to Milo Parker first for approval, and then they go to Professor McGonigal, and then they go to Professor Dumbledore. So that's a three-step process that all of my secondary campuses will have. Before I leave here, I want to show you just as a reminder, up at the top, I would add a workflow process here, or a workflow step. So if I need somebody else to approve it, I can add that in here. Or if I want to add a notification step, I can add that. And when I add a notification step, I have these options. It can go to a specific staff member, it can go to a member of a group, it can go to a campus, or I can say it's going to go to the requester. So what's going to happen at the end of this approval process is the person who submitted the form in the first place will get an email notification saying that it has been completely approved. So you have the ability to add that in. I'm going to click Save. And now I have a four-step process for all of my secondary campuses. It goes to those three people and then it goes back to the requester. In the upper right-hand corner, I have this button that I love that says Verify Workflow. When I click on that, this is what I want to see. Green check marks everywhere because that tells me for all four of the campuses that I have assigned to this process, it's going to work because these staff members are accessible from those campuses or the notification or the group or whatever is set up correctly and the process will work at all of those campuses. If it didn't work, I would have a red circle with a minus sign in it and I would know that that campus, I've got to go in and look at how they're set up, something's not right and this process isn't going to work for them. So I always like to verify my process before I get out and say that I'm, I'm good to go. So now I'm going to go back in and look at my elementary workflow for elementary schools. Again, on the general tab, I changed the name and then I limited it to just my elementary schools. And you'll notice that that leaves out some buildings, facilities, maintenance, food service, a service center, another service center, um, the technology center. They aren't included in either one of these workflows. But since this is instructional materials money, they probably won't ever use this form. So I've limited it just to the schools that, that are going to be doing this form in the first place. I'm going to go now to my workflow tab and see how it's different. For the elementary schools, it's going to go to a staff member who's going to approve all of that for all of the elementary. So this is a district level person. Maybe that's the elementary superintendent. I don't know. And then the second step is that the principal of that elementary campus will be notified. If I wanted the requester to be notified too, I could go in and say notification step, send it to the requester, click save, and now it's a three-step process, gets approved by a district person, notifies the principal, notifies the teacher who requested it or the staff member who requested it. Again, I can go over and verify my workflow and it's going to show me all the elementary campuses. And that's what I want to see is all of those green check marks, no red circles with minus signs in them because that would tell me there was a problem. So my hey. workflows are going to work here as well. Hey Paige. And then I can just close. Yes, sir. On that verify, uh, I can't even say it, verify workflow. Can you go back to that? Absolutely. Let me go back into the elementary one. 
I also wanted to and show. I can do it. Yeah. I can do it from either tab. The verify workflow button shows up whether I'm on the general tab or the workflow tab, but I can click on it. And there you go. If Did you, you want me to expand one? Yeah, I was just going to show you that if you expand one, it will also show you who those users are in those steps. Exactly. So this is this is my list of people. These are the principles. So it, it's starting to list. I can't see all of the names, but I can see the first two principles names because that's who is going to be notified in that step. And then that that information actually pulls from let me close this real quickly. I'm going to go over to the management app and in management you have manage user groups. There are three different kinds. The top two, the one that has buildings, that's all of your campuses, that pulls from the the profile. So if I'm listed at Aqua Elementary, it's going to put me in that group. The ones that have the wrench on them, they also are system groups. They pull from the profile. So in the profile, there is a group called principals right here. And these are all the people who have listed themselves as principals in their profile in my district. Now, there may be some things that are wrong here. This is, is something that is controlled by the individuals and their their update of their profile. So if I wanted to make myself a principal, I could. I wouldn't have, wouldn't be able to do everything I needed to do, but I could click that button. You also have the ability to set up custom groups. So if you have some groups that are not in that profile list or that you want to manage, you can set them up as a custom group. So I could make one that said elementary principals and put it in the custom groups. And that would be controlled by me, not by the profile. So that's where the groups pull from, even though we're over in form space, when I say that I want to um, look at a, or add a group to my, um, to my workflow, it's going to pull from there. So when I click open, when I click on a group or, or any approval step, if I say group, you'll notice it pulls first for the custom groups because they don't have that. Um, wrench on them. Then there are my system groups that have the wrench. So I can see all those groups that we just looked at. The other thing that I can do is if I said I wanted to pull uh, my principles, so I'll come down here and say this is going to go to principles, I want to make sure that I limit it to the school because remember that principal group was all the principals in my district. I just want it to go to the principal that the staff member who submitted it belongs to. So if the teacher was at Aqua Elementary, I want it to go to the Aqua Elementary principal and it doesn't need to go to all the other principals. So if I click on this button that says limit to school, it will just go to that one principal. I also have the ability to require all. So if I had made um, a software re review committee group and maybe there are three people, five people on the committee and they all have to agree, then I could select that group and I could say require all and then they all have to approve it before it finishes the process. So if I don't require all and there's multiple people in the group, the first person who approves it, it moves on. But if I want to make sure they all agree, I can require all. Those are options as well. Any other workflow questions? Uh, the only question, we had a question came in that says, doesn't the requester get a notification when the form is approved? Why would notify requester be used? They don't get an email notification. They get notified in their My Forms. So it would show up here if I had a current form, or let me look at a past form. It would show up here that it was completed, um, and I would be able to come over here and look at the workflow and, and see that everything is done. But if I have that green check mark, that tells me it's completed. That's the notification I get if there's no notification step. But if I want them to get an email, then I put them in as a notification step. Okay, let's talk sections. So I'm going to go to a different form this time. I'm going to go to this absence of duty form and look at the questions that we have here. So this is if I have to be out, I'm going to submit this form. Uh, some of you may be in, in larger districts where you have an online system that's part of your 
employee information system that you use for this, and some of you may still be doing paper forms, this is another option for you. So I could go in and put my name and the date and what is my reason for having to be out, and a brief description, and then you'll notice there is a supervisor approval here. Well, it would be great if I, as the, as the submitter, could approve myself, but that's not how we want it to work. We want the requester to fill out the top part, and then somebody else is going to mark it as approved or not approved. You might have some forms where it's not just approved or not approved. It might be that somebody puts the form in, and then it goes to an office professional who has to put the budget code in, and then it goes to the approver who has to say yes, to the teacher and yes to using that budget code. So you may have different steps in the process where different people have to enter bits and pieces of information and you can do that by using sections. So I'm going to go to my workflow tab again but instead of opening the workflow itself I'm going to go up here to workflow sections and you'll notice that there are some sections created. The default is that there are not any sections and so I'm going to make it look like that default it to no sections and the default is also for all questions to be assigned to the requester but I don't want that last question to be assigned to the requester so I'm going to come over here and make a, a section and then I'm going to assign my supervisor approval to section one and that means only the requester can fill out those first questions only whoever I give section one to can answer this question. And I might have two questions that go to section one, which would be one of the approvers or one of the workflow step people. And then I might have a couple more questions that go to another person. You can have as many sections as you need to divvy out those questions between the requester and the other people in your process. Once I say okay to that, it gave me a little message and I know that was tiny writing. What it said is be sure to publish to make that setting active. So I'm going to come over here and click on my publish button and you'll notice it's going to go from an exclamation point to a green arrow that tells me that change that I just made has been published. Now I'm going to go look at the workflow and I'm going to see that in the approval step over here in the bottom right or it's kind of middle right I guess you can see my sections whoever the person is who's going to do the approving they need to do that section one question so I'm going to assign them their section one question here I would give them the name if they didn't already have it but I can in fact I'll change the name so I'm going to say Milo is going to be the approver and Milo is going to fill out the section one question and then click the approve button and then the form will proceed. So I can have a form that goes to multiple people. I can have them just click an approve button and move it along or I can have them enter data and then approve it and move it along. And if I want to do that separate data for different people, I do that by using the workflow sections. Any questions about sections? Okay, I let's talk seen, about getting. I have not seen. Okay, go ahead. I was going to say I have not seen any come in. The only thing that I was going to say about workflow sections was that publish button is so vital to seeing sections. Like if it doesn't get pushed, it they will not show. That's that's an excellent point. I'm going to go back and and show that. Let me go to a different form. Close. Let me go to, I don't think I have any sections on my IMAT request form. So when I go to this one and I click on my approvers, oh, I do have sections in there. Bad example. Um, let's see if I go to Okay, so when I go to this form and I click on the approver, there's no section right here. There's no way for me to assign this person a section because no sections have been created for this form. Or I created the sections and I didn't publish it yet. So it could be either one of those things. Either I haven't made the sections yet 
or I haven't published it after I made the sections. So if you don't see them right there, that would be the answer. If I know I made them, but I'm not seeing them, then I would want to come up here and see, Do I ha if I have that red exclamation point, that means I forgot to publish. Right, and the key for that is for me, publish is like the word save. All it's doing is saving the changes. It's not publishing the form, making it active. It still can be in draft mode because you're still building it. If you look on the right there under admin, yeah, the yellow thing. <laughs> so publish, <clears throat> publish to me is just, it's it's another word for save. It's yes. saving your changes. Your form is not active on the web where people can access it. So then when you hit publish, when you're ready, then you can change it from draft mode to active. If I went to that beginning screen as an end user and said I wanted to submit a new form and I went to general forms, I will... Oh, I see one from just one school. I'm not seeing what I'm supposed to be seeing because that form is not published at the level that I'm at, but it is published at some of the schools apparently. Um, so I can have a form that I haven't published yet. Have, I'm sorry, I have published it so that I can save all my settings, but I haven't made it active. So it's still in draft mode. If I want it to show up on that beginning screen, I have to click that button and make it active. Okay, let's talk about the data a little bit. What happens when this information comes in? Well, the workflow information goes, you get, you know, people get notified, emails go in and, and take care of this process. They approve it, it moves it on. That's all you need to know. But if I wanna get the data out of my form, then I'm gonna go over to reports and I'm gonna to go to form analysis or survey analysis, depending on what kind of document I created. In this case, it would be form analysis, and I would find the form in question. So I would say, I'm at request form. I have some options over here I can filter and say, right now, I just need to look at the stuff from one campus, or I can not filter that and let it show me everything in the district. I can say, I only wanna see a specific date range, and it will narrow down my list to that specific date range. I can say, I only need to know about a couple of questions. I don't need to know all of the approval steps. I just need to know what's in there. So show me the stuff, don't show me the whole process. So you can limit it a little bit by using those filters if you want to. Then I can print, and print is again a little, uh, it's kind of like publish, I think. It's another word for because I can look at a PDF document that's gonna give me a, a form that looks similar to this over here with the, the graphs and the tables, showing me each question, the totals for that question, and then it's gonna give me a little pie chart for that question. But I can also export to Excel, and I honestly don't know if I have any data in this form, so it may be a blank spreadsheet when I open it up, but you'll at least be able to see the headers up at the top, well, I have one item in there. So you can see that it, it puts it in a spreadsheet. It gives me all of my questions as headers in that spreadsheet, and I get all of my data. So I can have a record of everybody who submitted this form, when they submitted it, what they put in, whatever fields I set up, that information will be there. So that's how I would get the information out if I wanted to use it for something else besides just a process to see if things are approved. And it may be that if it's, say, the IMAT form, whoever's in charge of IMAT would go in once a month and get the Excel spreadsheet of everything that's come in since the last time I ran this report and then move on from there. So you can get that information out however you want to. I may just want to look at that document. So I may say I want to print a summary report. Um, my computer is being yucky and not showing me PDFs the way it's supposed to, so I have to jump through hoops a little bit. But yours would just open up, most likely, uh, down at the bottom with your summary here showing you how many, what are the counts for each one of those answer types, and it would show me each question in this form. And that may be all you need on a regular basis is to get that information. Just depends on what kind of form it is. But that's how you'll get the data out is on the reports tab. Even though your 
exporting it for data, you're going to do it from the same place, whether I want to look at a PDF document or if I want to look at an Excel spreadsheet. I do want to show you this export summary because we get that I get that question fairly frequently. Um, which one, which of the exports do I want? This one is going to give you some formatting up at the top. So you're going to have headers and you're going to have some categories here up at the top above your, your actual data. This makes it a little bit more difficult for you to use formulas or to calculate on your spreadsheet if, if that's what you're using it for. So if you just need a printed copy and you want to use this, that's fine. But if you're going to want to manipulate the data anyway, um, pull out, you know, sort, do formulas, anything like that, then you want to export to Excel, not export the summary. So that's the difference between those two. If there aren't any questions, then I'm going to move on to elections. Elections are one of the fun things about form space. So I'm going to go over to the manage tab and we talked about district forms and surveys, school forms and surveys, web forms and surveys, but you also have an option over here for elections. And so I can click here. I have one election that I've already set up and I'm ready to run right now. If I wanted to create a new one, I would just go down to the bottom and say create a new form space document and I would select election as my type and give it a name. And then it's going to walk me through that process. It's going to open that document for me and show me how I can set it up. So I would set it up by putting a description in if I want to. Um, I can add ballot questions. There's really only one question type. It's a ballot question. And so I would say, what is the question? Um, maybe I want to, uh, maybe I'm going to have a one ballot question and it's going to be, uh, president. So that's my question. And then I can add, let me save it real quickly. Then I can add ballot options. So once I have my, oh, don't do it now. Once I have my question, I can add a ballot option, which would be the people I'm voting for. So um, I could say in the last election, it was um, Donald Trump. And then I can add another ballot option. Okay, so that would be the whole the whole deal right there. I have one question, who are you voting for for president? Here are my two options. That's what I would vote. In the example that I have here, I have prom king and queen. So when I set up my ballot questions, I have actually two ballot questions instead of just one. The first question is who are you voting for for prom king? The second question is who are you voting for for prom queen? And then each one of these are options. So I said my ballot questions are prom king and prom queen. My ballot options are each of the individual names. I can also add ballot codes. So if you're having students vote, you can upload a spreadsheet of all of the student ID numbers and when they go to vote, they have to enter their ID number and then it only lets them vote one time. So once you upload that list, it'll tell you how many av available codes you have, how many are used, so you can always monitor, well, we're about 50% 50, 50 of our kids have voted or whatever, but it, it will limit it to they can only vote with a code and it will only let them use that code one time. I don't have ballot codes in mind, but I'm going to show you what the voting looks like. So I could come up, go over to the voting kiosk and open it up. And I would probably maximize this screen and have it, you know, maybe on some laptops that they come in and they come to the this screen. And it, it kind of reminds me of the voting screens that we have when we go to our polling places. And so it tells me to begin voting. I'm going to click on that button and I can use the next and back buttons, and then I'm going to cast my ballot at the end. So I would click on begin voting. I see my first question, who am I voting for for prom king? Obviously Ryan Reynolds. And then I will click the next button. Who am I voting for for prom queen? Well, I like Julie, Julia Louis-Dreyfus. If I 
think, oh, did I click on the right Ryan? I'm not sure. Let me go back. So I can go back and next and check my votes, make sure it's exactly the way I want it to be. And I have one last chance after I've moved away from my last question, I click the cast ballot button and I'm done. So it says my vote has been cast and now it brings back up this voting screen and it's ready for the next person. I would walk away and the person in line behind me would step up and they would click the begin voting button. So you can have this kiosk going, you know, in, a, in, in the cafeteria before school or in the library or however you want to do that voting. If I was using a code, then after I click on the begin voting button, it would ask me for my code. I would type in my uh, ID number and then it would give me my questions. Once we're done, um, I'm going to come back to my election details. And the one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning is after I've made my ballot, I do have to start it. I can start it, I can pause it, and I can end it. So I could start it at the beginning of the school day. And if I don't want kids running in and voting in between classes or anything like that, I can pause the voting. And then they can't vote again until I open it up again. So I can control when they're allowed to vote. When I'm totally done with the election, I can close it and it will tell me the election has been stopped. So now it's done, it's over. And I can even go up to the top and print. Again, it's gonna do a little PDF, so I have to come over here. And I hope that's gonna be the one. And it will open up this document of election results that will show me how many votes have come in for each of the candidates and I'll, I'll get my total at the top and I'll get my percentages so I can find my winner. Hey, Pat, it's a great way. Yes, sir. Would this be a good way to run in a school board election, do you think? Um, I, I'm not sure about a school board election. I, um, I, I think that that would be something that you would want to do through a more secure kiosk. Um, this, like, if once I open that kiosk, any student who walks up to the screen could close it. You know, they, they, they could click on that. So you would want to have monitors and, and that kind of stuff. It's really more for students. It's more like an unofficial voting. But it is a great thing for, like, doing those sample elections in an election year, see how your kids would vote before the national results come in, or to vote for senior superlatives, or you know, student council elections. Those are all things that I would say this would be good for. Perfect. We had one question that came in about surveys. It was actually mm -hmm. about the data. So the spreadsheet that you created from the survey data, the first column had ID. And they were wondering if that was going to be able to pull in the user ID or the username who submitted that uh, survey. No. So when, when I, I was in form analysis and I was using this form and I did my export to Excel, this is where you saw the ID number, I believe. And that is just an ID number for this form. That is, or for this submission, that is not, um, it's not a person's ID number. So if I go back to manage, I have a form here called question types. And this shows all of the different types of questions that you can put into a form space form. So the first type that you can add it is an instruction instruction block, excuse me, my tongue got tied. This one does not require any user input, but it just lets you put some information out there. You can have a list question where you have the drop down list and they can choose. You can have a text question um, where they can enter their answer. This list question I do want to mention, if I go here to edit and I go to show options, I have the ability to make it a drop down list or multiple choice or multiple selection. It can be any of those types that I want. Um, I can have date and time questions where they click on a calendar. Um, and so they would, it looks like this, they would select their their date and their time. 
if I'm going to be absent, I might have to use a date and time question. I can create a matrix question where I put in the, they rate something, rows and columns. I can have a file upload, a signature. Um, this first one is actually where you print it and they sign it. The second type is electronic signatures, which is not really a question type, but you can enable electronic signatures on forms so that they have to digitally sign them, but you don't have to print them out like you would with this question type. The budget list lets you do dollars and cents or, or total counts of something. And then this last one is the document ID label, which assigns a number to every form submission. And you can either have these leading zeros or not. That's, that's up to you, but that's what that ID number was that you were seeing on that form. It was, it's a randomly assigned number so that when I submit my form, I can write down, okay, I'm number 1927. And if they ask me about my form, I can tell them I'm 1927 and they can look it up in the spreadsheet really easily. So that's really just a tracking kind of number. It's not, it's not information that pulled from the, the user. But very good question, and I'm glad somebody asked it because I had forgotten to show the question types, which is one of the things I had on my list to show today. Okay, any questions about the um, elections? I think they're fairly straightforward, but um, just think about ways that you might be able to use them. I uh, was just going to tell you we don't have any unanswered questions. How's that? Awesome. Awesome. Okay. I have two more things to talk about quickly. One is form management. So I'm going to go over to the settings tab and talk about form management. It might be that, um, let's say I'm going to go and create a new, a new form. And it's going to be a, a district form and it's going to be, um, let's see, it's going to be website approval. I'm going to put it in, well, I'll put it in general. I probably should have put it in technology, but that's okay. I created the form because I'm at the district level, but I want somebody else to approve that form, and that approver needs to be able to look at their own data. So I want to make them the manager. I can go over to settings and scroll down to additional management and reporting users, and I can say Milo Parker is going to be in charge of this form. Now, I need to zoom out just a little bit so you can see the bottom. When I make Milo the manager, I can make him a reporting manager or a full manager. If I check reporting, then he could go in and run all of those reports that we saw on the reports tab, export the data, use the data however he wanted to. It could be a working form for him. I get all the notifications, I do all the approvals, I run all the reports. If I want him to take over completely and even add the questions in himself, I can make him a full manager. So I have the choice of either way, and I'll say select user, and it tells me that now Milo has the complete rights to manage that form. This form has no questions right now, but when Milo logs in, he's gonna see that form over in his list and he's gonna be able to go in and add those questions. So just because you're the district level form space manager doesn't mean you necessarily have to build every single form. You can create them and assign them to somebody and then that person can go in and put the questions in and they can design the workflow and they can get the data out. So you can, you can assign those rights to somebody else if, if you need to. Um, you can also, under settings, merge existing forms. So if you had um, data from different forms, you can merge that together here. Uh, I, want, I would say be careful about that. Depending on the number of forms you have, it can take a, a little time. You can also import questions. So I have a form over here that's called reusable questions. And it has some questions that I used on a lot of forms and I got tired of making them. If I was at a district that had 45 campuses, that's not including departments. So if I was doing a district level form, that list that included schools and departments was pretty long. And anytime I made it a, a form that I had to have them select where they were from, I had to create that again. And so I didn't want to do that. So I can come over here to any of my forms and 
Let me just say I'm going to create a new one. And begin editing it. And I could go and say I want to import document questions. I would find, I could never spell this word. There we go. I would find that form, and here are the questions that were in that form. I may not want to use all of them, but maybe I want to use my school and department list so that I don't have to recreate it. I would click the import button. And now when I go over to my questions tab, that question is there for me already done. So if you have those kinds of questions that you use frequently, um, I always did, I did a lot of forms that were getting satisfaction kinds of forms. And so I had a rate this session that I could pull in at any time. And I had my school and department lists. You may have other types of questions that would be helpful for you to be able to reuse and that's how you can do it. Um, I also want to mention electronic signatures. If you're going to use electronic signatures on a form, they have to be turned on in three places. In the management app, they have to be turned on at the district level. Then in management here, under general options for, the, uh, for this application, I have to turn on electronic signatures for the application or for this module. And then for each form, when I go back to district forms, go back to general, go back to my test form, then I would come to the form itself and enable electronic signatures there. So that way I can have some forms that do have signatures and some that don't because I have to enable it individually at the form level. And that's where you would do it so that they could sign it. It's like it's an official thing, just like when you sign a PDF document digitally. Um, but I don't have to print it out to make that happen. I also have the ability here to allow the users to recall their form or not. So if they put a form in and then they need to change it, do I want to let them do that? Or do I want to make them resubmit the form and then I have to deal with the duplicates? That kind of depends on, on what kind of data it is, I think. But if you want to do that, that's at the form level too. And I would just check this button if I want them to be able to call their form back. And then the last setting that I want to talk about here is this one that says clear document responses. This is going to be part of our end of the year um, webinar that is scheduled for May 9th. Um, one, what I would want to do at the end of every year is run a report, export all of my data. So I'd want to print that uh, for each of my forms. I would want to come in and export to Excel so that I had an Excel spreadsheet of everything that was submitted all year long. That's just historical data. You may decide that I don't need that on all of these forms, but there are a couple of forms that I need to keep the data historically. And so I would export that. After I've exported the data, I would want to come into those forms and I would want to click on my settings tab and erase all document responses. And basically that's going to blank my form out so that I'm starting over next year with an empty form and I'm getting a spreadsheet just for next year. Then I'll clear it out again at the end of next year and start over the following year. So you don't have to make a new form that says 1718 I'm at request, 1819 I'm at request. You have one form and you clear that data out at the end of each year so that you get a year's worth of data in your spreadsheet. Again, we'll talk about that again at our uh, end of year procedures, which is on May 9th. That's the webinar topic for, for that day. My last topic for today is the Eduphoria community, and especially for those of you who marked yourselves as newbies or toes in the water, um, I want to make sure you know that we do have a community for forms, and, and the community is divided into categories. 
periodically when you go in, hit this little green button to refresh because as people are uploading, you may not get all of those changes. But if you're about to create a form, you can come in here and say, let me look in human resources. Um, oh, personal recommendation form is exactly what I was about to make. Let me look at theirs. And you can see if this form will suit your needs. And it doesn't have to be 100% because I can import this document into my system. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to put it in district forms and I'm going to put it in HR. And then once I have it in my system, I can go in and edit anything that I want to edit. So even if it's not 100% what I want, it might save me some time by having the majority of the questions there and all I have to do is go in and make a few tweaks to it. So you can go into the community anytime you want to, look in any of these folders and see if they have what you're looking for. Some of them named it with the campus or the district in there and some of them didn't. Um, but and these are not these are not forms that came from us. These are forms that came from other districts. And when you click on it, it will tell you up here who shared that form. So you'll be able to see when and by whom uh, up at the top. And you can decide just if those questions are helpful to you and it's a good jumping off point, then you can import that form just by clicking on that import document too. And then you can tweak it however you want to. That That will often be a time saver for you. If you build a form that you like, I'm going to go in and let's just pretend like my reusable questions and make it active for a second. Um, once a form is active, do I need to publish again? Oh, it's back to draft. What happened? Oh, I don't have any workflows in there, that's why. Let me come over here to this one and see. Um, so once I have a form that I've created and I've got my workflows set up, then this doc, this button right here, share this document will appear. And I can click on share this document and it will put it in the community. So I can say where I, what category I want it to go into and it will go into the community. So if you have a form that you think is helpful, Feel free to share it out there. Other districts would appreciate it. And if you're looking for a jumping off point, check out the community and see if somebody has something that will get you started. Any questions here at the end, Joel? I'm just answering a few that came in while the dog goes okay. crazy here. <laughs> <laughs> Started barking. <laughs> Well, that's why Milo's locked out of my office. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, okay. are you going to tell people who Milo Parker is in your... Well, I wasn't, but I just kind of did, didn't I? Um, yeah. So Milo Parker, who's been my approver on all the forms today, is actually my dog. And um, he's my office mate. He's locked out now because he's barking at the recycle man. <laughs> okay, uh, last two screens I want to show, and then we will sign off. Upcoming webinars, I do have a link here. That's goo.gl forward slash... L6DZHM, and I think the capitals do matter. That will take you in to register for the upcoming webinars that we have. Next Wednesday is Aware Development Roadmap, and then the following Wednesday is the one I was alluding to earlier, that um, Eduforia wrap-up end of your procedures. So those are our next two weeks worth. And then finally, if you're not already getting our updates, you can go to edgeforia.net forward slash news and scroll down until you find this form and sign up and you will get our email updates. Uh, we try not to inundate you with emails, but we do send out emails when we've updated software, announcing webinars, things like that. So that'll keep you in the know. And you can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. If there aren't any final questions, then I would like to say thank you for your time today. And if you think of something after we have signed off, feel free to email training, T-R-A-I-N-I-N-G, training at edgeforia.net, and one of us will get back to you as soon as we can. Thank you for your time today, and thanks, Joel, for being the question guy. Thank you, everyone. Have a good week. <laughs>